and thus we go to the um, mitops. Here is uh, the cross section of, uh, of the Parthenon. And what is interesting here, this is the Doric order. In the front you see the Doric order, a perfect Doric order with metops and triglyphs. But the second row of columns support a continuous frieze. Even though it's not the Ionic order, it's a Doric. The columns are Doric. But this is the first time where the Greeks in fact borrow an, uh, an element from a different order and introduce it here. And as such, the second, uh, the, the second row of columns support a continuous frieze, and we'll look at it, and we'll discuss why that was important. At this point, we just looked at the pediments right here. Now we go to the mitops. What is very important throughout entire Greek history, and in our case, in art, but uh, we see it. Uh, but the, we see Greek concern about the continuous contest in a human being between our rational powers and our emotional tendencies. And they knew very well that our emotions, in most cases, is our destruction. And they knew very well that in that continuous contest between our mind and our emotions, emotions most often are victorious. And that is what they wrote their tragedies about, that's what their literature is full of uh, these concerns, and of course their art. So when we go to Metopes, we see, for instance, the contests between the Greeks and uh, the centaurs. Or on other metopes, you will see the contests of um, the Greeks and the Amazons. Or you see the contest between the Olympian gods and the Titans who inhabited Olympus before they were kicked out by the Olympian gods. In all of these, this is not just an illustration of a Greek myth or Greek religion. For them it was religion. What it is, is trying to convey this continuous contest in the battle between Lepiths, who are Greeks, and Centaurs. The Lepiths, the Greeks, represent the forces of reason. And the Centaurs, the wild creatures, represent the forces of emotion. And this contest goes on continuously. It never stops. And it's not that the Tiths are always victorious. They know that the emotions can be, can often be victorious. Same thing in representations of Greeks and the Amazons. The Amazons were seen as the creatures of wilderness, while the Greeks are, again, the representatives of uh, irrational thinking and logic. And so the battle of Amazons and Greeks, again, becomes the battle between the mind and the heart. Same with Titans and, um, and the Olympians. The Olympians represent the powers of reason. The Titans represent the powers of emotion. And thus we go. Here we have, here, here is uh, the battle of the Elipith and the Centaur, and this is what it may have looked like when it was, uh, it was colored. Now, not all mitopes are of the same quality. As I said, Phidias did not carve these things all by himself. Uh, perhaps he did some. It's his shop that, that did it. Uh, and uh, what, what we see here is the same tendency as we saw with our Zeus, uh, the sculpture, the great sculpture of Zeus. We see him in, uh, in full frontality. The, for the Greeks, the human body, the male nude body was so incredibly important. It was so representative of what they considered beauty, what they considered proportion, harmony, symmetry, that uh, they uh, disregarded the natural movement in favor of natural beauty. And here we see on the two people, well, 
presumably the centaur, when the two creatures fight, they fight uh, facing one another. They do not exhibit themselves to the observer. And yet the convention here developed, the aesthetic convention this time, that we see their torsos. And that is what we see here. And yet this, uh, this constant pulling, the, the tug of war, the pulling and the pushing that we see between the legs, between the arms, and uh, reflected in their faces uh, is very, very impressive. Again, it's also a little humorous, though. I mean, I know. I it's know. also a little because because the human, without even thinking about it, has very clearly, instinctively tried to kick the centaur between the legs. Yes, but but there's nothing there between the legs. Exactly because it's, it's just, over, it's over there. there. Yeah, it's such an instinctive move. Yeah, of course, it's yeah. just kind of so funny. He really did just try to knee him. Right. Even though, remember in that first man and centaur from archaic Greece. Right. In that, that one. The, the, that one. He had it where it was supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah. In a man, not in a horse. Right. Yeah. yeah, That's, yeah. But it's just, you know, in the middle of this profound conversation about emotion versus intellect. <laughs> Meanwhile, you have this very humorous little scene, like, whoops, not there. I know. And interestingly, actually, and the, which the Romans will repeat, actually, we will see emotion on the faces of centaurs. We will very rarely see any emotion on the face of the Greeks, because the Greeks very much believed that whatever one's woes, Whatever one's troubles or hurts, nothing can be shown on one's face. One does not wear one's problems on one's sleeve. And therefore, in the midst of struggle, the face remains classically impenetrable. And that's when we talk about the classical face, we often talk about that. But that's interesting, because that's very clearly not where their roots come from. I mean, the very beginning of Homer's Iliad oh, sing, of course. is sing muse of the wrath of Achilles. Right. It's just interesting that this is what we've gotten. Right. They'll go there again in Hellenistic Greece. Mm -hmm. This is just the level of perfection which was very difficult to maintain. Mm. Yeah. This is my favorite. It looks as if it may have been carved by Phidias because it's just so spectacular. He is a brilliant sort of uh, heroic diagonal as this Lapith is in this tug of war pulling the centaur by his hair while exhibiting to us his spectacular physique. And if this weren't enough, he also, in the middle of battle, in the middle of this contest, he also kept his uh, cape behind him. And you can be absolutely sure that the cape was painted in a very bright color to bring out this beautiful torso of the Lapith. And the tug of war, the pulling and pushing, is here again spectacularly represented by that, that, that male torso. It's just unbelievable. And here's the case where not always the uh, Greeks are victorious. Uh, the mind is not always victorious. In fact, in most cases, the mind is not victorious. We give in to our feelings. We give in to our sentiments to our emotions and that's what represented here. The centaur is definitely victorious and the Lapith, while they try to make him naturalistic, he is bending his back in an attempt to show us his beautiful physique. Now this is what's called very high relief. In other words, parts of the relief in fact are sculptures in the round but they are still attached to, to the wall as the pediments, all the pediments are attached of course, but they are uh, discrete sculptures in the round. These are not. These are carved in, in a tremendously high relief from the wall. Well, again, depends. As you see, there's a lion's skin and the lion's tail is carved in very low relief. Lion himself, the skin, is sort of carved in the middle, middle relief, but then the body here is almost in the round. And then you can imagine that this, this arm was in the round and that's why, of course, it fell off because everything that's in the round, everything is, that's pre that projects from its base, from its support, is, um, uh, is bound to be lost. There was a wedding of uh, the king of the Lepiths and then centaurs got drunk and they, they left their forest and crashed the party and started abducting women 
and this is when uh, the battle ensued and Apollo, who is the god of reason, uh, took of course the side of the Lepiths and helped them to be victorious. And uh, what this is here, you see a centaur carrying a woman away. And thus the mythos. And now we go to this curious continuous freeze that was introduced in the Doric order. And the reason for that was because Pedius wanted to carve there the so-called Panathenaic procession. And that procession took place at regular intervals. And here you see it. Uh, what I think it was every four years, the entire city of Athens, anybody who could join, would put on their Sunday best and participate in the procession. The procession would go all around the Agora in, uh, in the lower city and then up the steps to the Acropolis and then in the Acropolis it would circle the uh, sacred sites and finally end up in, um, in the Erectium, in that little building that uh, I'll show you because uh, a, a little wooden statue of Athena lived there, was placed there. And by tradition, this was the statue that was granted by Athena herself to the citizens of Athens. And every four years, a new garment, a new peplus, was woven by the young maidens of Athens in order to dress that statue in the new garment. And this is the procession. And this is the procession that Phidias wanted to depict. And for this purpose, as you can imagine, uh, mitops weren't just good enough. Because mitops, they are like a book. You, you, you thumb the book, it's leaf by leaf. Whereas uh, a continuous freeze is more like a film, more like a scroll, where you can watch the thing happening without interruption. And so, Panathenaic procession encompassed all members of the Athenian community disrespecting of uh, social or financial standing. Here is another uh, illustration by, uh, by Balash Balo. You can see the Acropolis here, there again the procession people are gathering from everywhere. This is the lower town, the town of Athens, and the Acropolis and they're all assembling on the Acropolis. Today you can see a copy here this is as if this is the the entire frieze was in fact dedicated to this procession. Uh, the um, a large portion of it today again is in the British Museum, and this is how it is exhibited. It's called the Parthenon frieze. It's called either the Parthenon frieze or Elgin marbles. Either is immediately recognizable. And what it shows are different episodes in the procession. It shows uh, women carrying the peplus. Uh, it also shows uh, the girl who is giving the new peplus to a priest, perhaps, who will then be in charge of uh, placing it on the statue. These are the women who carry uh, uh, donations to Athena and even our Cariatids, when we think of our Cariatids, those female sculptures, it's uh, very possible that their origin lay in observing Greek women carrying loads on their heads. And today around the Mediterranean we often still see women carrying uh, large bunches on, uh, on their heads. And that is what you see here. Uh, a close-up of the peplus being given perhaps to a priest. This is uh, the ma uh, Greek maidens and the uh, Greek men also uh, part of the procession. Women are always accompanied by men, but women as you see here very much are welcome. It's not just a male procession. Uh, much cattle was brought for the sacrifice. And you see here, let me go back to there. There's an altar and you see that the sacrifice is being burned. And well, if you can see it here, when you get your PowerPoint, you'll be able to see it. 
And so cattle was brought for sacrificial offerings. Here you see uh, uh, goats and uh, there are, there's cattle and uh, more of it. And at the same time, the frieze shows the gods on the Olympus who are observing it and who are approving, disapproving, but certainly participating in the same procession. Olympian gods were certainly not going to miss on such an exciting event. And uh, here, they, we, uh, here they sit against uh, each other. And this one is done in that uh, aesthetic convention of turning his torso towards us so we can admire it. On the other hand, this is Hermes, we know who this is, because he has his hat in his lap and also his sandals have wings. So we know that this is Hermes, the flying agent of the gods. Uh, we do not know for certain who the other gods are. They are done in relief, in sort of medium, medium relief. Uh, more of the same here, these, uh, these actually are reproductions, but just so you, you can see what they looked like originally. These are the originals, and uh, one of the most famous uh, aspect of, uh, of the frieze is the, um, the cavalcade, uh, are the riders, the, uh, the Athenian uh, horsemen, and now here Phidias introduced Another, another feature that uh, will become uh, very much used in the future. He had, in despite Greek love of proportion and Greek adherence to balance and symmetry, he realized that he just didn't have enough room on the frieze itself for, for to give an impression of a great cavalcade, to give an impression of many, many, many men rising together and overlapping each other. So what he did instead, he carved the horses in a smaller ratio to the men. But the horses are done so well that unless one is aware of it, unless one knows about it, you don't even notice. But the fact is, look how low the men's feet are. It's because the horses are about three quarters of their uh, actual size. But as a result, he was able to create an impression of these men riding continuously, overlapping each other. And all of this is done, I mean, the whole thing is maybe five inches, uh, extending five inches from the wall. But the impression is of a, of a very large group of uh, people riding towards us. They were all painted, so they could be seen much better than we see them today, right here. And this is what it represent, how it is represented in um, the British Museum. And when you walk by this frieze, it does appear as if these are the writers that uh, proceed towards Towards you, you almost hear the uh, clanking of the hooves and the conversation. Uh, you may see it here even better because this is a drawing of uh, of the horsemen and uh, and the overlapping of legs and horses' legs and men's legs create an impression of this this continuous really brilliant movement. It, it's it's amazing. Uh, this is a painting that was painted uh, in the um, 19th century by Sir Lawrence Almatadema, as I told you when I showed you the Parthenon in um, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, 19th century was greatly enamored with all things Greek, and uh, many paintings were created by brilliant artists uh, that attempted to, to show the um, what uh, life in Greece may have looked like. And, um, and here is uh, Lawrence Almatadema, who is representing here the scaffolding that was built for Phidias when he did the, uh, uh, the procession. And here stands Phidias himself, 
and uh, he is showing the frieze of the Parthenon to his friends, and uh, they are all able to go there on the scaffolding, and it just re represents very nicely uh, how it may have been. And thus, uh, thus the Parthenon, and we are going to go, right, we are going to go to this little building called the Erection, after one of the legendary early kings of Athens. And as I said uh, just recently, this building held uh, presumably the uh, sacred, the wooden, the little wooden sculpture of Athena that Athena herself supposedly gave to the citizens many, many uh, eons earlier. Uh, this building was added on uh, over centuries because it's the oldest building, in fact, on the um, on the Acropolis. Before Pericles uh, had uh, had the architects and then Phidias built and decorate the Parthenon, uh, there was always, since time immemorial, uh, the Acropolis was a site of um, uh, of the ancient dwellings and the site or the religious site as well. But uh, with Persian invasions, the Persians in fact burnt it when they invaded Athens. And at first the Athenians swore never to replace it and always to remember uh, the horror that, that the Persians um, visited upon, them, uh, upon the Athenians. But then at the time of Pericles they, they decided, well, let's just make it beautiful. And that's when all of this was um, redone and built again, but the Erection, part of it was did survive and it is the, one of the oldest buildings on the Acropolis, but that's why when we look at it it's kind of it's a uh, uh, mishmash of, uh, of styles. Um, this is what it looks like today. Uh, it's all done in the white marble. The entire Parthenon was done in the white marble. Uh, it has our cariatides and it is called in fact the porch of the Cariatids. These are all copies. The uh, originals are in a uh, in, in museum in Athens. Also a couple of them are actually in, uh, in the British Museum as well. The, uh, this is, uh, if, as you look at it from the side, and as you see, this is done in the, this part of it is done in the Ionic order. You have the base, you have the volutes, and the grooves uh, uh, meet at a, at a flat uh, fillet. And uh, you can see the city of Athens behind there. This is our porch of the maids, porch of the maidens or the cariatids of uh, the Erection. Now we saw them at first, as you remember, in the treasury of the Sifnians in, um, in Delphi, but uh, it seems that this became a popular feature in architecture. To, uh, to use the forms of the maidens. In this case, their, their hands are not extended, they hang by, their, by the sides. And uh, it's possible that the inspiration came from the habit of women to carry weights on, uh, on their heads, and that, that which habit is still very much observable around the Mediterranean. With time, men will also be used, they will be called atlases. Because again, in Greek religion, Greek mythology, uh, one atlas held the sky, and as such, well, they will be called cariatids, male forms holding holding up weights will be called atlases. Here, we lost the color. We just don't have the color. We, we don't have any painting from ancient Greece. And clearly, both easel and monumental painting were, were very important to them, but we have none of it. And we lost the color, so we can only guess at the color. And uh, so this is one of the examples, of the created examples of the Porch of the Maidens. And here it is again. And as you see, it's, uh, the whole erection was constructed uh, uh, mishmash a bit, so there's no, it's very un-Greek in this respect, as much as Greek, the Greeks always attempt, especially with the uh, Parthenon right next to it, uh, to present very much a cohesive, uh, symmetrical, rational whole erection. It's not one of them. 
and it has a number of porches and it is uh, built as, uh, as a number of uh, units. But the most famous part of it today is, um, is the Portugal Maidens. And here you have it. This is what it looks like today. This is the porch of the maidens, and this what presumably it looked like at the time. And indeed, uh, I can imagine that uh, at the time when one approached it, one saw real women in different clothes standing there. The, uh, the impression must have been mesmerizing. And from here, let's see. We've visited the Parthenon, we've visited the Erection, and now we're going to this little temple. It's right here. It's called the Temple of Athena Nike. And it is the one little temple that sort of stands independently in front of the Propylaea. And it could be all the other buildings. You had to go through the Propylaea and then inside the other buildings. Whereas this little temple of Athena Nike had its own stairs and it could be visited separately without, in fact, entering the Acropolis proper. Um, it was destroyed, it was reconstructed, destroyed, reconstructed. It's uh, very much Humpty Dumpty it fell from the wall and, and it is sitting on this bastion. The whole thing, again, is white marble. Uh, but it's reconstructed again and here we can enjoy it. It is an Ionic temple and also built entirely of marble. It is very, very small. It sits to the right of us as we ascend uh, the Acropolis. Here's the uh, slide that I showed you in the very beginning. This, this is but now you know what's what. So as we approach the Acropolis, and we're not sure whether the staircase was straight or was it zigzag, not sure. On this, in this recreation it is straight. So one could have just walked up and then and then separate stairs here went to the temple of Athena Nike, right here. Here's the Parthenon itself. Within the Parthenon, you saw the great goddess of Athena, again done by Phidias. But outside, there was another uh, great gigantic sculpture of Athena, right here. The Erection can be seen, and there's the, there's the Propylia, that's, that's the entrance and the temple of Athena Nike, and here it is. These are, it was surrounded by a parapet. It's set, as you saw, on this bastion uh, wall. Uh, these are scenes from the life of the goddess Nike, and uh, more scenes here. It is, it is an Ionic order. It's a perfect Ionic order, therefore, you see the fluted columns uh, and with the volutes, continuous frieze, uh, the um, sculpture on top of the temples was called Acroteria. Uh, Acro, again, height, terrier, base. That's what they are called. Today, this is what uh, this looks like. And I actually showed, when I showed you the differences between the uh, orders, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, I used the Temple of Athena Nike as an example of a perfect Ionic order right here. And still another reproduction, sort of black-white, and you can see the parapet, the balustrade, and the balustrade was also decorated with a continuous frieze, as well as the frieze on the temple. From there comes uh, this, uh, it's really extraordinary sculpture, and uh, this is Nike, either tying her sandals, or taking off her sandals, we don't know. It comes, it's later, it's past the time of Phidias. Uh, we are at the very end of the 5th century, and uh, the end of the 5th century was not a happy time for Athens, historically, because at that time they had engaged in, um, in a suicidal war with, um, with Sparta, that will be called the Peloponnesian War, and uh, while they all united against the common enemy in the beginning of the century against the Persians. Then in the second part of the fifth century they engaged in this absolutely disastrous war with Sparta which will, um, which will put an end to its hegemony. Uh, there'll be a plague 
a plague out burst in in Athens, Pericles will die in that uh, in that plague, and after this, Athens will cease to be a political power. It will still be a tremendous intellectual power. For a while, only the fifth century was considered as a classical century, but uh, but today, one considers the 5th century and most of the 4th, until really the, uh, the rise of Alexander of Macedonia uh, in the uh, latter half of the 4th century. All of that is considered classical. Now, our Nike here comes from the end of the 5th um, century. And, oh goodness, talk about wet drapery. As uh, I described it in um, the uh, Parthenon pediments, it is even more so here. And you see it literally dripping from the nipple. You see the form of the uh, beautiful breast. You see the entire body. And she does come from the temple of Athena Nike. And now we go to still another female figure and uh, with wet drapery, but in this case it's wind-blown drapery. As Greek ships went around the Mediterranean, always had a prow figure. And in this case, uh, what is imagined here is the goddess Nike, still the goddess of victory, as she is landing on the prow of a victorious ship. And these statues clearly were relatively numerous in ancient Greece, and they served in fountains, and they would be, in fact, placed on a sculpted prow of a ship as they landed on it. And what we see here, we know who the sculptor is here, one Paeonius, towards the end of the 5th century again. Uh, she is moving. This time she is moving, and so the drapery indeed is flapping around, around her. She is not only uh, moving, but the drapery truly may be wet, because she is landing on the prow of a ship, and the uh, and the water from the sea may splash against her. Her garment is fluttering behind her, and her entire body now is visible. In fact, her one breast, her left breast and the left shoulder now are exposed, as they actually were in the Parthenon uh, pediments as well. But uh, there are no secrets anymore, and she is moving forward. The um, she had wings. This, presumably, this is a reconstruction, so you can imagine what she may have looked like. Uh, we see, again, drapery. Drapery, drapery, because drapery is so full of expression. Drapery can convey, as I said, movement, emotion, uh, the twisting and turning, something that, in fact, the nude body may not be able to portray, whereas the drapery can. So, when Phidias came up with this whole idea of wet drapery, he had given a woman's body so much more expression, in fact, that in, it often may have been the case with the male body. And there is the drapery, and here are the wings, and she's just landing on that prow. Uh, this clearly not the right colors. I mean, these are very, very bright colors, but this is the only one that I could find with colors, just so that we can um, imagine what it may have been. And you see her here flying and just about to land. And the whole idea, and they are marble, these are not bronze, they were marble, and this kind of carving of marble is virtuoso and the, uh, to, to be able to hold them up. Obviously, this marble had uh, support. In this case, the drapery supports the marble. Uh, and, and, of course, ultimately they fell off, as opposed to the bronze, as we saw with, the, uh, with Zeus, again, of Artemisian, where a bronze can, uh, bronze can uh, support these outstretched arms. It's interesting that it also conveys wind. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, the, the marble, I mean, right. you can carve... Wind, movement, splashing of the waves. Because you can carve water, and you can carve something to look like fire or right. wood, but this is really the only way you can That's carve wind. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's wonderful.
And thus we arrive at a female nude, a fully nude female, as opposed to a fully nude male. We had seen the fully nude male since the 7th century BC, and actually they appeared even earlier, but now we arrive three, four hundred years later at a fully nude female, and she is the most famous of them all. She was, car she was carved by one Praxiteles, uh, a sculptor of the 4th century, and as I said, at this point, part of the 4th century, half of the 4th century is still considered uh, classical Greece. Well, it will change with the death of Alexander the Great in uh, 323. So until then, we still have classical Greece. And this is our classical nude. It is not an original. It was carved in marble, not in bronze. It was not cast in bronze. It was carved in marble from the very beginning, but it is lost. And it was considered a marvel of the world. In fact, there are contemporaneous memoirs of uh, visitors to the shrine on the island of Knidos and uh, looking at this nude and marveling at the most incredible beauty. Now, as I said, what we see today, all the copies, and there are many copies of the Aphrodite of Knidos. She's called the Aphrodite of Knidos. So here she is. She uh, appears to be either having just come out of the water or about to step in the water. She uh, is marble. Marble, remember, needs support because uh, bronze is cast in a so-called lost wax technique. Not The technique is not lost. It's the wax that is used in the process that is melted out and is lost. And as such, the, uh, the bronze sculptures are hollow inside and sometimes it's actually called the hollow bronze technique. And even though the material itself, the, the weight of the bronze is tremendous, nevertheless, nevertheless, because it is hollow, it is not nearly as heavy as a full sculpture of the same size and as a result marble needs to be supported whereas the bronze once attached to its uh, pedestal can stay by itself and here as a support is used a vase a greek vase and then uh, aphrodite's uh, garment that's uh, negligibly thrown over the vase but it also serves as support for the arm. Nevertheless, the arm, even on this copy, was lost, as you see, and then added later. She is in perfect contraposto. Her head is uh, slightly turned. All her weight is on her right leg. Her left leg is uh, free, and she is modestly covering uh, her nether region. The, um, the, the head itself Classical Greek sculpture, the head is anywhere between uh, one seventh, one eighth of the body. It looks to me more one eighth here than one seventh. But this became as much of a canon for a female nude as the refers was for a male nude. And she was sculpted, uh, all sorts of variations of her were sculpted standing up lying down, but this is the Aphrodite of Knidos that um, became the classical female nude, repeated over and over and over again from, from back in the 4th century BC into the 20th century by Picasso. You see, once you see uh, a Knidian Aphrodite, you will always recognize her. This is the island of Knidos, and this uh, she presumably was placed in a round temple and could in fact be seen from many sides and she was herself looking at the water. Uh, the myth of uh, Aphrodite is that she was born out of the waves. Uh, in fact, that's why she was called Aphrodite because Aphros in Greek means the waves or the foam, which is why Africa is the land beyond the foam. And here she is, and this is a possible reconstruction of the temple and, um, and how she was positioned in that temple. So we finally arrived at the female nude. 
and then also in the fourth century they developed an architecture of Greek theatre. Now Greek theatre, the phenomenon of Greek theatre goes back to times immemorial it seems originally to have been religious festivals for the god Dionysus and at first those the, the, the religious uh, ceremonies themselves took place around a makeshift altar and then everybody would sit around on the hills remember Greece is a very hilly country would sit around on the hills and watch and participate etc but then with time they would bring their makeshift chairs perhaps or benches but in the fourth century they began actually to carve into the living rock of the hill to create the uh, cavern of the Greek theater as you see it here one of the greatest examples is the theater at Epidaurus that was created at about the same time as Praxiteles was carving the Canadian Aphrodite and uh, it is still very much it's functioning uh, there are many festivals that take place there in the summers well not this summer but usually and theatrical performances opera uh, all sorts of uh, things go on in these theaters now the original theater would look something like this it had a backstage where actors could change where props were kept and uh, here is a black and white possible reconstruction and here's a plan so this is our caveat this is the seating in the middle is the orchestra where the altar originally stood and where the chorus would perform before the orchestra and then the the stage itself scene is called is there's scene that's what we just saw the architectural uh, structure and proscenium proscenium today it's called is in front and here it is so this is uh this would actually be our uh forward stage proscenium right here and then this structure would be called the scanner and this is where props were kept as i said as um and the, the actors uh, would appear. So all the Greek theaters had this structure when they finally were built. But today this is what it looks like. As with everything in Greece, they, they became part of nature. They became uh, an indelible part of nature just as with their temples. Uh, it all was serene, it all was uh, holistic, it all was part of one another and in fact while watching theatrical performances one also saw this stunning surrounding landscape and, and the performance was part of the landscape and landscape became part of the performance. Uh, one sees these theatres all over the Mediterranean today and they are used as I said with the theater we just saw there today very many of them have been somewhat rebuilt and are used for contemporary performances here's another one there is a spectacular theater antique theater in Taormina Sicily uh, they'll talk about the Romans soon enough but the Romans will pretty much adopt everything Greek and uh, they'll expand these theaters, they'll make, it, they'll make them even greater and build them all around their, their empire. And one of them still exists here in uh, Sicily. And, the, and the, when Sicily was Greek, then a Greek theater was built there. But then when the Romans came, when they took over Sicily, then they rebuilt it. So there, there are many layers of this theater. Again, the view is absolutely spectacular. And still another one in, uh, in Orange, in France. And that's where these, the Scena and the Proscenium, it, it, it's, it's actually still in existence. This is the best backstage that survived from the ancient world of, uh, of all those Greek theaters. And as you can see here, it is used continuously for for various performances. And thus we came to the end of our classical presentation. 
and we'll start on uh, the later stage in Greek artistic development next time and uh, I'll see you soon.